Another type of um, reaction, um, actually two other types, acid-base and gas evolution reactions. These um, can also happen when we have this partner swapping, where the reactants um, switch ions and then something happens. So an acid-base reaction is also called a neutralization reaction because you have an acid and a base reacting with each other and they neutralize each other. And the products of that are generally um, water um, and a soluble ionic compound known as a salt. Um, and then the other type is a gas evolution reaction, which as its name suggests, it produces a gas. And so this is often seen as bubbling. You, um, we saw that with our copper experiment where we, where we took the copper wire and we put it in nitric acid and we saw this fizzing and then we saw that brown gas, right? So that's a gas evolution reaction. So we need to talk a little more about what are acids and what are bases. So there are different definitions of the acids, of acids, and I am not going to require you to remember the name of the definition, but you do need to be able to recognize acids. So the Arrhenius definition is that it is a substance that produces hydrogen ions in aqueous solution. And that's basically the definition that I gave you before. Acids are molecular compounds that when you put them into water, they produce hydrogen ions. So an example is HCl. We put that into water. HCl as a pure substance is actually a gas at room temperature. You dissolve it in water and it ionizes. It separates into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Um, let's think about this hydrogen ion. How many electrons does a hydrogen atom have? One. It has one proton and one electron. When it becomes an H plus ion, it does that by losing its electron. All that is left is a proton. It's a little hard to think of a proton as being like an atom or an ion, right? It's just like this smallest particle. I think of hydrogen ions as being like newborn babies. They do not go out into the world by themselves. You ever just, you know, go for a walk and find a crowd of newborn babies hanging out? No. You see babies, but somebody's holding them or pushing them in a stroller, right? They're not just out on their own. Hydrogen ions are too, too small to be out by themselves. So what this hydrogen ion, which is just a bare proton, does is it rides piggyback on a water molecule. This is happening in aqueous solution. There are gazillions of water molecules around. So the hydrogen ion that gets formed has no problem finding a water molecule. When, when this rides piggyback on a water molecule, it forms H3O+. We've got, we're short an electron, so we have a positive charge, and then we have three hydrogens and one oxygen. This is called the hydronium ion. I believe it was on your list of ions to memorize. Um, we often use H plus and H3O plus interchangeably, which can be confusing to students. Um, we do that because using H plus makes the equations so much simpler. And we just understand, everybody understands, H plus is never there by itself. It's actually riding on, on water. So we'll talk about the infants, the babies, understanding that they have parents or babysitters or guardians or something with them. Okay. A polyprotic acid, so a hydrogen ion is a proton. Polyprotic means many protons. Polyprotic acids have more than one ionizable proton or ionizable hydrogen. And they re release them one after the other. So sulfuric acid, H2SO4, the ionizable hydrogens are always written first in the, in the formula for the acid. So H2, it has two hydrogens that can be ionized. It, it, it does one first and then another. And you learn a lot more about why and how and how much in Chem 1B. But for now, we're just going to remember that this, it's a strong acid in the first ionizable proton. So you put H2SO4 
one proton comes off and it has ionized completely into H plus and what's left, HSO4 minus, hydrogen sulfate ion. The hydrogen sulfate ion gives up its hydrogen a little bit. So that's a weak acid. The Arrhenius definition of a base is a substance that produces hydroxide ion in aqueous solution. So an example would be sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is a soluble ionic compound. It dissociates into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. So any of those soluble hydroxides are going to be strong bases. There are bases such as NH3 that do not contain hydroxide ions. Like how can they, how can they produce hydroxide if there's no hydroxide in them? They do that by pulling a hydrogen ion off of a water molecule. So acids are, are producing hydrogen ions that ride piggyback on water molecules. And bases like NH3, so NH3, you put it in water. And what it does is it steals one of water's hydrogens. And so you get the ammonium ion and hydroxide ion. So ammonium contains no hydroxide, but when you mix it with water, it produces hydroxide ions. And some bases can produce two moles of hydroxide for every mole of base. Those are things like calcium hydroxide, which has two hydroxides, um, CaOH2. So when we have an acid-base reaction, we have an acid and a base, both present here. And the hydrogen ion from the acid combines with the hydroxide ion from the base. You put those two together and they make water. Water is not an ionic compound. But if you mix hydroxide and hydrogen ion, it forms water. So here's our acid, HCl. Here's our base, NaOH. And we can think of this in the same way as precipitation reactions in terms of looking at switching partners. So here we have hydrogen and chloride ions and sodium and hydroxide ions. They're going to swap partners. Let's draw that out. I'll do it above. So here we've got hydrogen ions and chloride ions. And here's sodium ion and hydroxide ion. And we're going to just switch partners. So we're going to put sodium with chloride and hydrogen with hydroxide. So we rewrite them over here. And so plus one, minus one, put them together. This is sodium chloride. Salt is a generic word for ionic compound. Um, H plus and OH, if you're, if you're having a, a blonde moment, I can say that because I am blonde, um, you might say, oh, I'll just put those two together, plus one, minus one, and I get ho. And then you should say, huh, that looks weird. Oh, wait a minute, that's H2O, that's water. Okay. When we look at the net ionic reaction, I didn't mean to, but I wrote the complete ionic reaction up here, basically. We see that the chlorides didn't actually participate. That was a spectator. And the sodium ions were spectators. And so we have H plus plus OH giving us water. So the net ionic equation for most acid-base reactions is this one right here. H plus plus OH minus gives H2O. It will be that as long as the salt that is being formed is soluble. If we form an insoluble salt, then things are a little more complicated. Any questions? So here is um, an illustration of, of this reaction. So here we have um, a hydrochloric acid solution. And if we look at the particles in here, we have the hydrogen ions from the HCl riding on the water molecules, so they're little hydronium ions. And then we have chloride ions. Chloride ions are much bigger. They're able to go up by themselves. And here in the sodium hydroxide solution, we've got sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And then, of course, there's you know, lots of water present as well. When we mix these two together, the hydronium ions and the hydroxide ions, when they meet up, the one says, hey, I've got this extra hydrogen ion on my back, and I'm really tired of him. 
And the hydroxide says, you know, somebody stole my hydrogen ion. Could I have him? Oh, yeah, here, take him. And then, bang, you've got two water molecules, and things are kind of back to normal. And so that's why down here, we don't see any water molecules in, in bold colors here. The water molecules are now just in the background like they were up here. But the hydronium and the hydroxide ion, when they get together, they just make two water, water molecules. And so we've got sodium ions and chloride ions. We have salty water. Any questions? So here's that list again. The ones listed in black are the strong acids. So those are the strong acids. They ionize completely. If you're writing net ionic equations, you have to separate those into ions and, and deal with spectators and stuff. In the red, here are three common um, weak acids. There are a host of weak acids. Anything that's not on this list, not one of these, is a weak acid. So formic acid, acetic acid, hydrofluoric acid. So HF, fluorine is in the same family as chlorine, bromine, and iodine, right? Why isn't HF a strong acid? How can we remember that? I think of fluorine as the baby sister in that family. Fluorine is the smallest in that family. And like hydrogen, it's the littlest kid. The, the baby of the family kind of breaks the rules. So HF isn't following the pattern of her sisters, Cl, Br, and I. Um, these are, in black, our strong bases. So these guys are strong. Strong bases are going to be metal hydroxides. <coughs> and ammonia is the only weak base that I will expect you to remember. There are many other weak bases, but that's really the only one we're going to run into. Any questions? Yes. So you, so you want to summarize the strong acids and bases? Yes. You should know the strong acids and strong bases. Now, the strong bases is metal hydroxides. So it's not like it's going to require a lot of thinking to, you know, it's just basically one thing. If it's, if it's an ionic compound, a metal and a hydroxide, strong base. Do you all have the same question? Okay, writing equations for acid-base reactions involving a strong acid. So these examples are kind of giving away what's going on here, um, but on a test there's no like title for the problems. Write a molecular and a net ionic equation for the reaction that occurs between aqueous HBr and aqueous LiOH. Here we're given the formulas for the reactants. So I've got HBr and it's aqueous. I don't have to think about it because they told me. And I've got LiOH. And they tell me it's aqueous, so I don't have to think about that either. We're going to do the sw swapping partner thing. We're going to follow the same pattern as we did for the precipitation reactions. Below this equation, I'm going to write the formulas for the ions. So I've got H plus, and I've got Br minus. I've got Li plus and OH minus. And then I'm going to see what happens when they switch partners. So then I'm going to rewrite them. Li plus and Br minus and H plus and OH minus. And I should see this and say, oh, that's making water. So water, H2O. Is water aqueous? It's not really aqueous. How can water be dissolved in itself? Water is water. It's a liquid. So when temperature isn't specified, you should assume room temperature. What's the state of water at room temperature? It's a liquid. And then LIBR, put those two together. Is that soluble or insoluble? Soluble. All lithium compounds are soluble. 
So then this is aqueous. So then let's look at that. Is it balanced? Yeah, it is. Sometimes that happens. It's balanced already. Yes? So there's no reaction? There is a reaction because we formed a liquid. We formed a molecular compound. And we'll see that when we write the net ionic equation. So this doesn't tell us that we have to write the complete ionic equation. So, you know, I kind of already did that here, <coughs> didn't I? I just don't have the pluses and all the state symbols and stuff in here. But I had H plus and Br minus, Li plus and OH minus, and those are actually the correct numbers of each of those and the correct numbers of the things over here. But is this present as H plus and OH minus ions? No. This is a liquid, and so it's not written in a complete ionic equation as ions. Then we look at that, and we cross off spectators. And I see bromide on both sides, and I see lithium on both sides. So for the net ionic equation, I'm going to write down what's left. I've got H plus aqueous, and I've got OH minus aqueous, and my product is just H2O, which is a liquid. If you write a complete ionic equation not recognizing that it was no reaction, like maybe you were doing a, a precipitation reaction that wasn't really a precipitation and you got um, something soluble here. When you write the complete ionic equation, all the things will be written as ions, and when you cross off the spectators, everything crosses off because nothing actually reacted. So molecular equation, net ionic equation. Any questions? Acid-base reaction with a weak acid. So here is HCHO2, and they're actually telling us this is a weak acid. We should be able to figure that out, though, because it's not HI, HCl, HBr, nitric perchloric, or sulfuric acid. It's not one of those six, so it's a weak acid. So... It's asking simply for the net ionic equation. Uh, I'd like to start with a molecular equation, even though it doesn't ask for it. So we've got HCHO2, and that's aqueous because they told us it is. And we've got NaOH. We should look at this and recognize that that's a strong base. It's a metal hydroxide. So to predict the products, we're just going to swap partners. Now, this may be a little more difficult for you to see what's it going to come apart into. There is a reason that this H is written first and the other H is written second. The first H is the one that can come off as a hydrogen ion. So you can take off H+, plus, and then everything else bless you, is part of a polyatomic ion. If I have one hydrogen, what's the charge on this anion? It needs to be negative one. And then I've got sodium hydroxide. Oh gosh, I wrote really big. It's not going to fit very well. Na plus and OH minus. So to predict the products, I'm going to swap the partners. And I'm seeing, well, H plus and OH minus, that's going to give me water, but I'll write it out. So that's going to be water. That'll be a liquid. And then the other two partners, um, Na plus and that funky thing, CHO2 minus, I got a plus one charge, a minus one charge, meaning Na, CHO2, that looks like nacho 2 be a movie sequel. Um, is that going to be soluble or insoluble? Soluble. We can predict that even not knowing what CHO2 is. I think it's formate. Um, all sodium compounds are soluble. 
So this is going to be soluble. Okay. And then I would need a plus in here. Is that balanced? Yeah, it is. But we need a net ionic equation. So are we going to separate HCHO2 into ions if we were writing a complete ionic equation? No. So it does say AQ, but if it starts with H, you have to ask yourself, is this a weak acid? If it's a weak acid, you've got to leave it alone. So for our net ionic or our total ionic equation, complete ionic equation, I'm just blithering now, um, we're going to leave that guy alone. It's aqueous, but it's a weak acid, meaning it only ionizes a little bit. So we're going to write what most of it is present as, which is intact molecules. And then sodium hydroxide, do we write those as ions for an ionic equation? Yeah. That's not an acid, it's a soluble ionic compound. How about water? Do we split that into ions? No, it has an L. We leave it alone. Ah, L for leave it alone. How about this one? Should we split this into ions? Yes. This is a soluble ionic compound. It's not a weak acid. So we should separate that into ions. So we've got H plus, and we've got that funny guy. N-A, yes. Just checking to see if you're paying attention. Just screwing up. Okay. It's easy to do. That would be my complete ionic equation. What are my spectator ions? CHO2? Well, I have CHO2 minus over here. I don't have CHO2 minus over here. So that, that got changed a little bit. Here it was part of a weak acid, and here it's an ion by itself. Sodium. Anything else? No. Net ionic equations for reactions with weak acids are going to be a little more complicated than for strong acids. So here we have the weak acid plus hydroxide ion. And that's going to give us water and the anion from the weak acid. Any questions? Okay, acid-base titrations. We're going to be doing several of these in lab, not today, but during the semester. Titration is just the name of a technique. In a titration, we take um, a solution where we know the concentration, and we react it with a solution where we don't know the concentration, with the goal of finding out that concentration. So we use a chemical reaction, an acid-base reaction, to help us figure out what the concentration of the unknown is. We add these two solutions together until they are in their stoichiometric ratio. We talked about limiting reactants and how when you do a chemical reaction, oftentimes one thing gets used up and there's leftover or excess of the other. In a reaction like this, we're mixing them together so that they are just right in, in amounts. Okay, so if you were baking, you'd have just enough of each thing, each ingredient, you wouldn't have any extra in the house. You'd have to do that intentionally, wouldn't you? So we, we then calculate the unknown concentration using stoichiometry. This point where we've got stoichiometric ratios is called the equivalence point, where we have an equivalent amount of both reactants. Well, when you're mixing an acid and base, both of them, you know, in solution look like water. 
I wouldn't taste them or drink them, but they look like water. How can we tell when the reaction is at the equivalence point? We need an indicator. We need something to indicate that we're done. So indicators are compounds that change color when the solution undergoes significant changes in the acidity or alkalinity of the solution. At the equivalence point, the number of moles of hydrogen ions that have been added is equal to the number of moles of hydroxide ions that have been added. Because the, the net ionic equation is H plus plus OH yields H2O. So we have equal numbers of moles of hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion. Let's look at illustrations and pictures. The indicator that's being used here is phenolphthalein. I will not give you a spelling test, but that's a, that's a fun one. Phenolphthalein. I kind of have to spit when you say that. Um, phenolphthalein is an indicator that changes color. It is, it is colorless in acidic solution, and in basic solution, it's this pretty fuchsia color. So this is a setup for a titration. Here we have, at the beginning, we have our acid that is in the flask. So there's a lot of hydrogen ions. We're not showing the spectator ion, the anion. It could be chloride. It could be nitrate. It doesn't matter. And here we have our base, sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide. The important thing is the hydroxide. So we're going to add hydroxide ions to our hydronium ions, or hydrogen ions. So add we, as we add these together, the hydrogens and the hydroxides form water molecules. And we have fewer and fewer hydrogen ions. When we get to the point where they are very close to equal, the indicator begins to change color. Because phenolphthalein, in a more basic solution, is going to be pink. And so it will begin to turn pink. And we stop the titration right at that just first blush of pink. We're looking for really, really pale pink. This is my favorite color, but we're not going for that color in a titration. We're going for really pale pink. And this is how it might actually look. So it looks like you're adding water to water. And as you add more and more sodium hydroxide, you begin to see pink swirls right where the sodium hydroxide is meeting your solution. That's because it hasn't mixed completely yet. If you take that flask and give it a swirl and mix it up, then those hydroxide ions will find hydronium ions, and, and they'll react, and it'll go clear again. And the idea is you want to go until one drop makes it pale pink. If you go to this color, you went too far. So let's do a calculation for an acid-base titration. So this is an application of solution stoichiometry. The titration of a 20 mil sample of an H2SO4 solution of unknown concentration requires 22.87 milliliters of a 0.158 molar KOH solution to reach the equivalence point. What is the concentration of the unknown sulfuric acid solution? This is stoichiometry. We need a balanced chemical equation. So we should start with that. So we're given the different um, reactants, H2SO4. And for a calculation like this, the state symbols are not important. And we've got KOH. And what's, what's that going to form? Some of you can predict it. Some of you may need to, um, to write the ions and swap them. So I've got H plus and SO4, 2 minus. I've got potassium, and I've got hydroxide. We don't have to worry about whether things are strong acids or weak acids. We're not writing that ionic equations here. So when I swap those partners, I'm going to get H plus and OH minus. That's my water. And then I've got K plus and sulfate ion. This is a 2 minus charge. So when I put these guys together, I need K2SO4. K2SO4.
it's very important to balance the equation because we need those um, mole ratios. Is this balanced? No. Um, it might be easier to look down here to see what's going on. So I've got sulfate here and sulfate there. I've got two potassiums here, and I've only got one over here. I need to put a 2 in front of the KOH. And these hydrogens, maybe let's write the numbers in there. So I've got two potassiums, one sulfate. When I put a 2 here, I'm going to get two potassiums and two hydroxides. Um, if I look at this H2SO4, there's two hydrogens in there. So two hydrogen ions and two hydroxide ions, in order for those to be equal on each side, I need two water molecules. Any questions? So kind of a shortcut, I look at H2SO4 and I say, oh, that's a diprotic acid. It has two hydrogens at the beginning it's going to react with two moles of base. This is a mono basic base. <laughs> this has one hydroxide. I need two of these to take care of the two hydrogens. So there's our chemical equation. Get this out of the way. Now I have my balanced chemical equation. I'm going to use it, just like I did with solution stoichiometry, to organize this information. 20 milliliters of H2SO4. 20 milliliters. 20.0 milliliters of H2SO4. And it says it requires 22.87 milliliters of the KOH. 22.87 milliliters of the KOH. And they give me the concentration, the molarity of the KOH, 0.158 moles per liter. And then it says, what's the concentration of the unknown H2SO4? Question mark. What would be the most reasonable unit for that? Molarity. The same as the other one. Moles per liter. So we need to come up with a path here. I'm going to write the path at the top. We have two substances. Anytime you have two substances, you cannot use the dilution equation. Students are sometimes tempted to use the dilution equation to solve titration problems. That's not a good idea. What makes it especially dangerous is that sometimes it works. It won't work here. It the dilution equation is for when you take one substance and you add solvent to it. You don't have two different substances. So treat titrations as stoichiometry. I've got two different compounds here. This one has the question, and this one has more information. So I'm starting with something about the KOH. I'm starting with something about the KOH, and I'm going to end up with something about the H2SO4. What's in the middle of stoichiometry problems? Moles. So whatever I start with there, I'm going to get to moles of KOH. And I'm going to get to moles of sulfuric acid. What am I trying to find again? Molarity, moles per liter. If I have moles, how do I get molarity? divide by the volume. So here I've given the volume, it's in milliliters, but I could convert that to liters. This is another one of those problems where there's a couple of different very good ways to do it. Um, I'm going to show you the one that I think is less confusing to students. So we're going to go to moles of sulfuric acid, and then we know that molarity Molarity of H2SO4 
is going to equal the moles of H2SO4 divided by the liters. How can I get to moles of KOH? I've got volume and I've got a concentration, a molarity. The molarity is the conversion factor. I'm going to start with a volume and convert to moles using this. Now we've got milliliters here. Pardon me? So people have different ways of, of doing this. I think the most straightforward way is convert these to liters. Um, so if I convert 22.87 <coughs> milliliters, we could do millimoles, but nobody seems to like those. So um, if we're going to convert this, we're going to have milliliter on the bottom and what milli means, 10 times negative 3 on top. And so that's going to be 0 0.02287 liters. If you're good with the metric system, you can just move the decimal point three places. But it's really important to move it in the correct direction. I don't know how many times I've had people tell me that 22 milliliters is 22,000 liters. Well, take a minute and think about that. We've done labs now, right? Can you picture a graduated cylinder, a 10 mil graduated cylinder? Picture how big one milliliter is. It's a cube that's one centimeter on a side. It's little, right? Picture a liter, half of a two liter soda bottle, right? Which one's bigger? The liter. Liter's bigger. Here we have a number and a unit. We're going to end up with a number and a unit. The bigger number goes with the smaller unit. The smaller number goes with the bigger unit. So when you move that decimal point, you need to move it in the correct direction. If that didn't make any sense to you, do it this way. This way always works. So I could start with liters of KOH. You could also string that all together in your equation if you want to. So point 0.2, no, not point 0.2, point zero oh, two two eight seven liters of KOH. And then I want to go to moles of KOH. <coughs> and the liters is going to be in the bottom. And that is this 0.158. And the liters cancel. And then I need to go to moles of H2SO4. And I need moles of KOH in the bottom. What numbers go in here? I need one for the H2SO4 and two for the KOH. And that two is what you miss if you mistakenly use the dilution equation. So 0 0.02287 times 0 0.158 divided by two. So this gives me my moles of H2SO4. Zero, zero, one eight <coughs> zero six seven three. Bless you. Um, how many sig figs should that have? Three. So the one, the eight, and the zero. I need to take this number and plug it into the molarity equation. Moles of sulfuric acid divided by liters. Twenty milliliters is how many liters? <coughs> 0 0.02 or 20,000? 0 0.02. But don't lose those significant digit zeros. So my molarity is 0 0.00180673 moles divided by 0 0.0200 liters. Zero point zero nine. Zero three three six five is what my calculator says. Three sig figs, zero point zero nine zero three.
Any questions? The only difference between this and the um, solution stoichiometry problems we did earlier is there, um, instead of asking you for the molarity of, of the unknown, they were asking you for the volume and they were giving you the molarity. That's the only difference. Gas evolution reactions. Um, some reactions produce gases directly. Here's an example. Potassium sulfide, you mix it with sulfuric acid. You have an ion exchange. Um, we have the ion swapping partners. Now we've got potassium with sulfate. That forms an ionic, a soluble ionic compound. And then we've got the hydrogen with the sulfur, H2S. H2S is a very smelly gas. Um, you might think, oh, that looks like an acid. Well, it does. Um, you, you just need to remember that if you get H2S as a product, even though this is happening in an aqueous solution, it's not going to dissolve and be an acid very well. It's going to form bubbles and come out and drive everyone from the room with its stench. The other kinds of reactions we're going to look at are are reactions that we can predict products by swapping partners, but then one of the products there is actually unstable. So if we mix sodium hydrogen carbonate and hydrochloric acid, we're going to get sodium chloride and H2CO3, which is carbonic acid, but carbonic acid isn't stable. It decomposes like this and makes water and carbon dioxide gas. And you just have to remember that carbonic acid does that. So these are the, the four different types of products that you have to remember are going to form gases. So the first one is when you get H2S, ooh, H2S as a product, you just need to remember that's a gas. And then these three, if you get this product, H2CO3, H2SO3 or NH4OH. We need to remember those are going to decompose. Thankfully, they, they all decompose in the same way. So let's look at how that happens. So H2CO3. When that decomposes, all of these three, they lose a water molecule. So it's going to give off water and what's left. So I look at H2CO3, and I've, I've taken these two hydrogens in the water, and I take one of the oxygens. What do I have left? <coughs> CO2. CO2 is gas. That's my gas. Same thing for H2SO3. H2SO3 decomposes into water and what's left. SO2, another smelly gas. Sulfur compounds tend to be very stinky. NH4OH decomposes into water and, so this here, I've, I've lost this O and this H and one of those H's, and what do I have left? Ammonia. <coughs> another smelly gas. So you just need to memorize those. More flashcards. Write the molecular equation for the gas evolution reaction that occurs when you mix aqueous hydrobromic acid and aqueous potassium sulfite. Now, on a test, it's not going to tell you that it's a gas evolution reaction. It's just going to ask you to write the equation. So we're going to follow the same pattern that we have done. We're going to write the reactants and then swap partners. So hydrobromic acid, what's the formula for that? It's HBr. The prefix hydro tells me this is not an oxyacid. It's bromide ion and hydrogen ion. That's what it forms when it is uh, dissolved in water. So here's hydrobromic acid, HBr, and potassium sulfite, 
Well, potassium's K plus. I told you to <coughs> memorize sulfate. Sulfate is SO4, 2 minus. This is the light version, SO3, 2 minus. So when we put those two together, I get K2, SO3, and that's aqueous. So when I swap partners, I'm going to get um, K plus and Br minus, and I'm going to get H plus and SO3, 2 minus. So I put those together, K and Br. Is that soluble or insoluble? Potassium <coughs> is soluble, AQ. And when I put these two together, I'm going to get H2, SO3. And you should say, oh, wait a minute. That's one of those things that decomposes and forms a gas. So it's going to decompose. It's going to give off a water molecule. And then I'm going to cross off the H2 and one, one of those oxygens. And what I have left is SO2. And that's a gas. So up here, instead of writing H2SO3, I'm going to write what it falls apart into, H2O liquid and SO2 gas. And then I have to balance it. Is it already balanced? No. No, it isn't. Here I have K2, and here I only have 1K. And that's not OK. So I need to put a 2 here. So I've got two Ks and two Ks, and um, two BRs and only one BR. So I need two BRs over here. Now this is an example of a situation where this polyatomic ion did not remain intact. There's SO3 over here. There's no SO3 over here. So then we do have to look at sulfur and oxygen separately. I have one sulfur and one sulfur. And on this side, I have three oxygens. And over here, I have two oxygens in the SO2 and one in the water. And so that's balanced. Any questions? It's very important to learn how to write um, balanced chemical equations to predict products by swapping partners. Really, really important. If you're struggling with this, and you need to cut some stuff out because we can't always do everything that we think we should do. If you leave the gas evolution reactions out, yeah, you're going to get dinged points on an exam, but you can pass the class without getting the gas evolution reaction. But you've got to get the, the partner swapping thing.